coming once again festival of ideas a lecture series in memory of dd kosambi opening lecture by rajdeep sir desai india's leading tv journalist and editor in chief of cnn ibn on media explosion and its impact the festival of ideas organized by the department of art and culture good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome with that small inauguration ceremony all of you are now part of the dd kosambi festival of ideas as the chief minister already said this is not just a series of lectures but it is a movement to break mindsets a movement to replace old ideas by new ones for example the old idea of corruption can only be replaced by the idea of good governance and this has started to happen and what better way to start this festival of ideas than with rajdeep sardesai i recall my first encounter with him he will not recall it but it was i think the first elections after goa got statehood and we were very young then we were trying to make sense of goa of statehood and of journalism itself and if i recall correctly rajdeep sardesai came down to cover that elections he was then in the times of india and all we did was look at him and say that that is rajdeep sardesai how lucky he is to be in the times rajdeep is one of the best known faces in india he is more of the kind of person you see him now you see him again and you see him all the time he is on television but television does not define him alone he has done a lot of things before he got into television and very often when we journalists sit down to discuss things we always say that if rajdeep had not got into television he probably would have been the editor of the times of india i don't know how the far that is true but this is what we normally discuss and i now call on mr anand salkar the editor of sunaprant the only konkani daily in goa to give us an insight into the experiences and the circumstances that molded rajdeep into one of the finest journalists of our times good evening ladies and gentlemen we begin with the second edition of festival of ideas with a man whose reputation precedes him he is an expert in the most lethal weapon of modern times information and its most popular form news for the connoisseurs of goikarpan the elusive goan identity is a blue blooded goan son of the legendary cricket maestro late dilip sardesai he chose the proverbial pen over the willow despite an llb from the prestigious oxford university he chose the noble profession of a journalist joining the famed times of india mumbai he emerged as a record maker he was the youngest assistant editor at the tender age of 23 and later the city editor at the age of 26 one of the first few to sense the tremendous potential of the audio vid- visual media he was there to witness the birth and growth of india's first 24 hours news and current affairs channel new delhi television ndtv his award winning weekend debate program the big fight was the highest rated english news show for over 6 years currently is the editor in chief of one of india's leading news channel cnn ibn surely this won't be his final destination despite his busy schedule 
He finds time to contribute for his regular syndicated column, which appears in six leading newspapers around the country. He has also contributed to the several outstanding books. When man dare, accolades follow. Our speaker for today has won numerous awards for his excellence in journalism. He must have lost the count of it. The prestigious Padma Shri conferred upon him in the year 2007-2008 should be the icing on the cake. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been living through turbulent times, a period which has seen many upheavals and phenomena. One such phenomena is the unbelievable media explosion. In its wake, it has left many amongst us bewildered and wondering about its eventual impact. So wouldn't it be apt to have someone who has seen it all telling us about the interesting aspects of the glamorous and treacherous trade? Hence, ladies and gentlemen, I feel privileged to present our man for today, the real son of the soil, the one and only Rajdeep Sardesai. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, respected uh, Chief Minister of Goa, Mr. Rani, Mr. Khala, uh, respected uh, citizens of Goa, uh, all my friends here from the field of journalism and many others, some family friends here. Uh, it is indeed an enormous pleasure and honor to be here at the inauguration of the DD Kos second DD Kosambi Festival of Ideas. Mr. Kosambi is a renowned intellectual and I would, and I, I, I deem it an enormous honor to be asked to come and speak here on this occasion. A couple of the previous speakers uh, while introducing me suggested I am a son of the soil and I have said this before when I have been in Goa, I am a bad Goan. I, I don't speak Kokni. I, I come here all to uh, rally, often just for 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, my children see Goa often through the eyes of the beach and not through the eyes of the temple. Uh, and yet I'd like to believe that a part of me is and always will be gone. And I'd like to believe that's the better part of me. Uh, because to me there is something very special about Goa which will never leave. It's a bit like there was a poem by a Rupert Brooke called the soldier that a part of him would always be England. I have always believed that a part of me, wherever I am, will always be gone. So to that extent, it is an enormous privilege and pleasure to be here. So thank you all very much in the first place for inviting me here. I was told by the, uh, by the organizers that I have to speak for one hour. And I thought one hour must be a very long time in life. And then I was told that there will be an in uh, interactive session after that. So I thought maybe I need to crunch both into one hour. They said, no, no, one hour speaking, one hour interaction. And then I wondered whether this was then going to be like some long drawn out Hindi cinema where everybody would start walking out because you probably know the end sequence. Uh, but I will, I, I do believe that there is lots to talk about. And so, given the time constraints and, and perhaps the desire to ask questions, we'll try and do it in a way that makes it as exciting and entertaining as possible and interesting in terms of the ideas that we can perhaps develop over this hour or so. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, someone mentioned the Times of India and that early election that we did that I covered here 20 years ago. It was great fun. But frankly, you would have not called me on stage here had I remained a journalist in the Times of India. Because television suddenly converted me from that journalist who used to come to Goa, travel around Maharashtra, wherever, traveled across the country with pen and paper into a journalist who suddenly had a television camera and was in your drawing rooms every day. It transformed the notion of a journalist. From a journalist who was there in the press club, you suddenly became a celebrity because you were on television. You were suddenly famous. You are no longer just a journalist with a biased staff reporter byline. 
the anonymity had gone. And that's what, in a sense, the media explosion has done to me as an individual. But interestingly, we are here in the month of February 2009. And my mind now goes back to February 1995, 14 years ago, probably to this day, to an experience that I will not forget, but which I would like to share with you here today. It was about five in the evening in the month of February 1995. I, was, I had just joined New Delhi Television. I had limited knowledge of TV. And we were starting a current affairs program which was going to go on a Doordarshan Metro channel called News Tonight. That was the program that was going to air that night for the first time. A private news broadcaster was going to air a news program in the country on a government channel, Doordarshan Metro. At 5 in the evening, we get a call from a gentleman called Mr. PVRK Prasad then Principal Secretary to the then Prime Minister Narsimha Rao and Principal Secretaries, if there are any here, know that they are very powerful. I don't know, sir, who your Principal Secretary is, but whoever it is, usually the Secretary of the Chief Minister is sometimes more powerful than the Chief Minister. Uh, but anyway, Mr. PVRK Prasad, for whatever reason, believed that he was more powerful than even Narsimha Rao. So at 5 o'clock when PVRK Prasad rang up, most of us almost got up and stood up wherever we were. Mr. Prasad then proceeds to say that he's just heard that we are coming out with a news program that evening at 9.30 and then proceeds to ask Dr. Pranay Roy and we were there in the room with him when he did this, who gave you the permission to have a private news program on television? Don't you know that news is the monopoly of the government? That it is the government which will decide about news? Private news players cannot decide on news. This was 5 in the evening. Poor Dr. Roy, being the gentleman he is, tried to say, but we have a contract, sir, and you know, we, the monies have been paid, we've set up a, a system. He says, I don't care about your contracts, that's the law of the land. The law of the land is that news is the domain of the government. For half an hour we argued, weren't getting anywhere, and finally pleaded with someone else in the Prime Minister's office and said, look, you know, this can't be true, you've got to help us. 6.30 in the evening, we get another call from Mr. Prasad saying, Okay, we've reached a compromise. The compromise is that you will have to change the name of your program, which is News Tonight, to Tonight. Because the word news cannot be put. The moment the word news is there, it has to be removed. <laughs> it was a classic Yes Minister situation and he said, From now on, I have informed Dr. Darshan that this program should come under the current affairs category, not the news category. So as a current affairs program, I'm allowing you to call it, but please change the name of the program from News Tonight to Tonight. So our poor graphics guys, who had been spending all their hours making lovely graphics of News Tonight, were spending the next three hours removing the word news and calling the program Tonight. That is the manner, or that is the background, in which news emerged in this country that one day in February 1995, 14 years ago, with a program called Tonight. And this is the backdrop under which, in the last 14 years, we witnessed what is being described here today as an explosion, as a revolution, as a remarkable journey, really, in a sense. Good, bad, ugly, as most journeys are, it is a remarkable journey. From that day, I don't know where Mr. PBRK Prasad is, he's probably back somewhere in Andhra Pradesh, God bless his soul. But the fact is, I hope he watches the fact that there are about 12 to 13 Telugu news channels alone today. And I hope that when he's switching, he switches between one and the other on a consistent basis. In fact, I, I looked at the figures last night and I asked someone in the office to recheck them. There are officially, as per the TAM, the television audience meter ratings of November 2008, 460 registered channels, official channels, this does not include city-wise cable channels that are mushrooming all over, including, I believe, memorably now one in Goa, which is uh, giving 24 hours company information. In fact, three or four now, I think, in Goa, which is, again, remarkable. There are 460 officially registered with TAM. They include 14 Hindi news channels nationally, 11 English news channels nationally, and at least 34 regional news channels nationally, not including, as I said, those channels which are limited to cities or perhaps only work through a particular cable network. These are just satellite channels registered through TAM. 
That's the nature of the explosion that has taken place. From one half an hour program 14 years ago to 460 channels across the country. What has it done? On one side, we have to welcome it. Because it is a revolution that has broken the monopoly of the government over the media. I know I say this in the presence of various politicians, but politicians I'm sure and Mr. Kamath, Mr. Rane are all honest politicians, so they will acknowledge that <laughs> there is nothing more terrifying than the government using the media as a propaganda weapon. In fact, this is one of the few countries in the world which still has an information and broadcasting ministry. A ministry which should not exist does exist because it has to provide presumably importance, employment, whatever, call it what you will. But the fact is that we had that machine because there was a mindset which Mr. PBRK Prasad exemplified that, the, that in some way news was the government's domain. It was almost Goybelians, it, it was almost like Stalinist. It was Stalinist, it was, it, it, it was effect, effectively like Goebbels being the propaganda minister, whoever was IMB minister, and there have been many memorable IMB ministers from the time of V.C. Shukla and Kissa Kursika to present day ministers, something happens to them when they become IMB ministers. They believe they can control the media and that's been the mindset that somehow news was the monopoly of the government. I'll give you the example of the VP Singh election of Allahabad. It's given as a classic example to journalist students because that, those were the days of Doordarshan and this was after VP had left the Congress and was contesting an election against uh, Sunil Shastri, I think. Sunil or Anil Shastri, one of them. And at the end of the day, if you wa watch Doordarshan in the late 80s, you believed that VP Singh was going to lose his deposit. As it turned out, he won by over 2 lakh votes. But in those days, we had Doordarshan as your only interface with the world of news. And if you were sitting here in Goa, and you were watching the news, you would actually believe that VP Singh was losing. Because all you saw was Anil Shastri or Sunil Shastri, whoever it was, cutting ribbons. Anil Shastri and Sunil Shastri giving speeches. It appeared whenever a, uh, uh, there was a gathering of Mr. Shastri, the camera would pan to thousands of people. When there was a VP Singh meeting, no one would be seen. And yet the fact was that VP Singh won that election. That won't happen again. That cannot happen again. Because today, whether you like it or not, that monopoly of the government over the airwaves is over. Even though, ironically, the law and the 1885 Telegraph Act, which still sometimes governs various things that we do in the media, still is there. The law is still archaic. In fact, there is still a question mark even over the existing law over what should be the rules of uplinking and downlinking. And there was even one member of parliament who wanted to set up a system in Jalna and Maharashtra to block the signals when Star Plus first started uplinking out of this country. That's the background within which we come. What else has, ha, has television done? It has prevented the state, we believe, or I believe at least, in some way from manipulating the reality. Let's, let's give a concrete example. The riots of Gujarat of 2002, well, whether we like it or not, good, bad, ugly, played out in front of live TV. Different people have different perspectives of how the coverage was. But the fact was the coverage was there. It was there for people to see. Contrast that with 1984 anti-Sikh riots, where ironically four times the number of people, or suddenly three times the number of people who died in Gujarat, died in Delhi in 1984. Yet what are the images you have? Few black and white photographs here and there. A government of the time could actually get away perhaps in 1984 in the manner in which it could not get away in 2002 because the nature of the media had changed the nature of the beast if you want to call it a beast had changed in a sense take the riots of 1992-93 the Mumbai blasts of that period and contrast it with, with the way 2611 was covered within moments of 2611 taking place it had become not just a Mumbai event, not just a national event, it had become international, it had become global. The images were being broadcast across the world. And it is my belief that in some way, what we've seen that has happened post-2611, the manner in which the world has reacted, has partly been because they have been equally horrified. In 92-93, those images were not available. It 
we've created a distance between, let's say, someone living in New York and someone living in Mumbai. But with the nature of television, the nature of satellite television, which is instantaneous, which is live, you suddenly found that that entire geography between, the, between New York and Mumbai had evaporated. The world was one. We saw it to an extent during the tsunami. Look at the manner in which the world reacted to the tsunami. It became within hours, days, a global catastrophe. Contrast that with Latour. I remember covering that earthquake in Latour. It was almost impossible even to get through to Delhi because we were there in Latour. All communication lines had broken down. And with a phone you would desperately ring up someone through a teleprinter and then try and telex your message desperately trying to somehow or the other tell the world the gravity of what had happened in Latour. Years after Latour happened, I don't think the world recognized how bad it was. 10,000 people died there too. But the tsunami and the manner in which people woke up to the reality of tsunami or the Kutch earthquake of 2002-03 suggested that the moment you were in this world of, a, of an exploding media, the world became a smaller place. And it has had a profound impact in various forms. Let me be even more contentious and suggest that possibly, just possibly, the Babri Masjid would not have been demolished in the age of the electronic media. I remember being a young journalist in those days in Mumbai. The first image we got was from BBC. It was a photograph first. That evening, it was a Sunday. I still remember it was a Sunday because we, normally a journalist, you remember Sunday duty days. So it was a Sunday. And the first images we got were hours later. And they didn't shake the conscience that we knew something had happened. But even being in Mumbai, we didn't know quite what had happened in, in Ayodhya. In those days, had 24-hour news television been there, I have no doubt that if the car sevaks had assembled in the manner that they chose to before the, uh, before the masjid was demolished, the television cameras would have taken over the Babri Masjid. There would have been less space for the car sevaks and more space for the television cameras. And in that scenario, to demolish it, and then for the police to claim, hum, hum, hum nahi jante kya ho hai, would have been very difficult. Whoever was responsible for it, Kalyan Singh, whoever and that liberal commission, blessed soul, will hopefully tell my grandchildren the true story, since they haven't told me the story. No commission in the world has had as many extensions as the liberal commission has had. And Justice Liberan will probably continue to take even more extensions. The fact is though, that had television been there, had it been played out live, I think we would have had a greater sense of what went on in the events that led up to the Babri Masjid demolition and possibly the pressure on the system, whether it was Narasimha Rao as Prime Minister,